recording here. So we've got this on, on wax. All right, so temperature and pressure are kind of the two main focuses today. Uh, and lastly, phase change. So we have phase changes from solid to liquid, from liquid to gas, and even from, in some cases, solid straight to gas, in the case of like dry ice, carbon dioxide. Um, we have specific names for all three of those things. Right? If we're going from a solid to a liquid, we call that melting. If we're going from a liquid to a solid, we call that freezing. Right? Those are pretty straightforward. Um, if we're going from a liquid to a gas, we call that evaporation or boiling or vaporization. Right? There's a lot of a lot of vocabulary for that one for some reason. And if we have the, the more rare occasion when a solid goes directly from a solid to a gas, we call that sublimation. And if it goes directly from a gas to a solid, we call that deposition, right, to deposit. So far, so good. Okay. We can represent phase changes versus energy using something that is called a heating curve. On this heating curve, we can see the three states of matter and the two transitional periods, melting and boiling. In this case, because we're adding heat, right? Uh, and heat and temperature are different things, right? Again, temperature is an average kinetic energy, whereas heat is an amount of energy, right? Heat is a type of energy where, where temperature is just a, a measurement of the motion on the subatomic, uh, on the sub macro level. You'll, you should notice something interesting about this heating curve, right? We can break it into two gross categories, right? We can, we can break it into those parts of this heating curve that have some slope, and we can break it into parts of this heating curve that have no slope at all. What you should notice immediately is that in the middle of a phase, right, solid, liquid, or gas, we can increase the temperature. That means that as we add energy, the particles move faster and faster and faster. Strangely, and what should stand out to you guys is, is kind of like a cos cognitive dissidence, is that during the phase changes, melting and boiling, we are not actually increasing the temperature of that matter. Instead, all of that energy is going into breaking the intermolecular forces, breaking those particles apart. Right? So if we have a solid, we can increase the speed of vibration by adding energy. But as that solid starts to melt and become a liquid, that energy, instead of going into increasing the vibration, will instead go into breaking those, those vibrations and breaking individual particles away and forming a liquid, right? So we have a stable temperature at uh, a phase change, which for us as human beings is extraordinarily useful. I don't know if there's any like um, any bakers out there, but if I need to, let's say, melt chocolate, I'll use something called a double boiler. And a double boiler is like a little tin with water underneath it. We boil the water, we put the chocolate inside the, the middle and it will melt. Chocolate is really interesting because if you get it too hot, it will burn. You know, if you get it to 107 degrees, it'll burn. If you get it too low, it won't melt. So double boilers are extraordinarily useful for chocolatiers <laughs> because you can keep that temperature constant during that uh, phase change. Uh, let's say I, I, I have two dogs, neither of them are particularly well behaved. Um, let's say I was making spaghetti, right? I, I boil my water, I have a whole pot of water, I throw my spaghetti in, I let my dogs out, and then I notice that the fence door is open, both dogs have escaped. I run chasing the dogs, right? I catch them, 10 minutes later I return to my spaghetti, right? The really useful thing for us as human beings is that the temperature of that spaghetti will have stayed at 100 degrees that entire time, right? If I were doing something like frying an egg and I left that egg on my oven, on my stove top for 10 minutes, I would come back to a charcoal, you know, patch on my frying pan, right? That egg would be absolutely torched. With something like boiling substances, the temperature does not change. So I could leave that spaghetti uh, in that water. So long as there is still some liquid water, the temperature of that water would still be 100 degrees. Does that make sense? All right, so, so this is an interesting thing and heating curves are really useful to kind of describe when materials are going to boil, when they're going to melt, when they're going to freeze, <clears throat> things of that nature. Let's talk very briefly about each transition piecemeal and what's happening on the molecular level as we're transitioning from something like a solid to a liquid. When we have a solid, the particles are stuck very powerfully together, right? The attraction is very powerful. 
So as I'm adding energy, the only thing that can happen is, is vibration, right? But as that vibration reaches uh, such a peak that particles start to, to pop off, right? They're still attracted, right, to that, that mass, but they're not attracted to such an extent that we can't start to flow. So as particles pop off, all of the energy is going into those, those popping, right? It's like when you, when you make popcorn, right? They're all gonna stay inside that container because they, you know, they're stuck there, but some of those are going to, to really energetically pop off and some of them are not so much. Uh, I, that's what's happening when we have a solid. I have, hopefully this video kind of brings some more clarity to this process. Uh, in this case, what I have is a, a box of sand, Underneath that box of sand, I have a bunch of little air jets. And I want you guys to imagine that this box of sand is something like an ice cube, right? Without the air, those particles are affected by an attractive force called gravity, sticking them all together, right? But as air bubbles through them, right, the vibrations start to increase, which allows for, for more space between the molecules for those particles to flow over one another. And something really interesting happens. So let's watch before I, you know, continue to gal on. Solid sand. Weird techno music in the background. Start to bubble air through this substance. And what happens? By bubbling air through, we're allowing space for those molecules, those in this case, sand particles to flow over one another. This process is called liquefaction, right? Movies in the 50s were obsessed with this, right? We called it quicksand. Then they stop the air and suddenly the sand becomes solid once again. Yeah. Would this thing work with like other substances or only sand? That's an excellent question, right? So, so in this case, the, the only reason why this works is because that the sand was a very fine sand, right? It allowed for, for each individual particle to flow into the small spaces that were made available by the air bubbles. Does that make sense? So if I had something like a bunch of marbles yeah. and I tried to push air through them, right? The air would simply flow between those marbles, right? But because the, the sand was so fine, it was actually a really good representation of what molecules might look like if we increased their speed, right? They'd bump apart from each other and then some would flow into those spaces that were made by the, by the collisions of the sand particles or in this case, the air bubbles. So if I had something bigger, it wouldn't work. But anything, if you had something like baby powder or talcum powder, you'd, it would work. If you had something like baking soda, it would work. You need something very fine and very small that can flow into those air particles, the, the, the vacuum that those air particles make as they rise to the surface. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so, so again, I think that, that hopefully that gives you kind of a, a mental picture as to what's happening as particles are melting, right? Um, and then again, once we, once we stop vibrating them, once we stop adding energy, they stop uh, flowing over one another. Liquids to gases is a little bit harder. I couldn't find any particularly good videos to kind of demonstrate this as an analogy, but if we were to continue to increase the airflow, or if I were to increase the pressure of that, uh, of that box of sand, right? Some of that sand would get blown up into the air and cause dust. Right? That's kind of like evaporation. If the sand is, is flown out of that box and allowed to kind of flow freely in the air, right? that is evaporation, where particles no longer are attached to each other, even remotely. Right? So I now have particles flowing, those particles collide, one of those particles gets ejected up into space, 
right? And because they're so small and light, right, they're carried away on air currents, just like the clouds were carried away in that video I showed you last class, right? Where they start to flow in the patterns of air, because remember that air isn't empty space, right? Air is full of oxygen and carbon dioxide and, and uh, nitrogen and, and argon, right? There's a bunch of stuff surrounding us all, all, all the time. And if that particle were to be ejected into that soup, right? If they're not pulled back down by the interparticulate forces, then they're allowed to escape into the atmosphere in that case. Now, we can do something very interesting. Uh, again, human beings are, are really good at manipulating the universe. And it's not just about temperature and uh, intermolecular forces. There's a third um, variable that we can affect to change phases. So I want you to imagine that on the left-hand side, we have um, a bunch of steam, right? A bunch of water vapor in a can. Right, and that can is just a little bit above 100 degrees centigrade. So all of that water is going to stay vaporous for as long as we keep that can heated. What I can do is if I have a little perfectly fitting top, a lid, and I'm able to push that lid down, I can force those particles closer together. Right, and as I'm forcing them closer together, I'm forcing them to also experience intermolecular forces. As they, get, as they get closer and closer and closer, they get more and more attracted. And as they get more and more attracted, they're more and more likely to glom onto each other. So I can force something to stay a liquid beyond its boiling point if I can pressure them into it. Does that make sense to everybody? And we experience this. So if you guys have like a box of instant rice, like let's say, you know, rice or, or or Spanish rice or yellow rice or something like that in your cupboard, you look on the back and there's cooking directions. There will be two sets of cooking directions. The first set of cooking directions will be for cooking the rice at uh, sea level, right? If you were to cook it, and the second set will be cooking the rice at a high altitude, something like Denver, because Denver is a mile higher than uh, sea level the air pressure there is significantly less. That means that water is able to boil at a lower temperature because the pressure is lower. Individual water molecules are able to escape, right? That vessel, because there's less air for them to push aside, right? There's less air pushing them down, keeping them inside of your pot. And so if we alleviate that pressure, it makes it easier for us to boil water, which means that it's going to boil at a lower temperature, which means it's going to take longer for us to cook that rice. The opposite is true as well, right? So there's a, there's a submersible, the, like a pretty famous science vessel that's pressurized to uh, an atmosphere and a half. That's a deep sea uh, science vessel. In that science vessel, you would be able to cook rice significantly faster because the water would be able to get hotter before it ended up boiling. The same is true if you guys have like an instant pot, right? Instant pots, uh, you, you clamp the lid down with those little straps. And the reason why it is so effective as a cooking tool is because it allows that water inside, it, it pressurizes the water inside and allows it to get to a hotter temperature during its boiling phase. Does that make sense to everybody? So we can affect boiling, we can affect melting by changing the pressure of a vessel. The greater the pressure, the higher that temperature has to be before that substance boils. The lower the temperature, excuse me, the lower the pressure, the lower the temperature it is. And, and eventually you get out to something like outer space, right? And you have a cup of water. That cup of water, well, it'll probably start to freeze, but as it freezes, it will also evaporate very, very quickly. Right? because there's no pressure at all there. So water molecules, any water molecules, even slightly fast enough to escape the intermolecular forces are going to be thrown out into space. Right? There's no air to push it back down against the other water in that. Now, we can represent this idea using something called a phase diagram. So if I have something like um, dry ice, right? dry ice is interesting because it will never reach a liquid state on Earth. So if this phase diagram, can you see my mouse cursor? On the, so I want you guys to kind of come back to the keynote for this one, um, not the keynote, whatever this thing is, my zoom. Come back to the zoom for this one so you guys can see my mouse cursor. If we had something like carbon dioxide, 
right? We can make it into a solid by decreasing the temperature to a significant degree, right? It would be somewhere over here, right? Low temperature, uh, and then somewhere we'll make this right here, earth pressure, right? One atmosphere. As we increase the temperature, it will go straight from solid into gaseous state. And we call that process sublimation. As it does that, right, it immediately becomes a gas. And that's where we get like cool things like dry ice machines, which create fog. Um, but if we were to, if we were able to increase the pressure, right, if I had like a little pressure chamber and I were to heat that carbon dioxide up, we could actually make liquid carbon dioxide, assuming we could increase the temperature. So we can kind of mess around with the phase of matter by messing around with both the pressure and the temperature. And, I'm, and I have ordered dry ice, right? And I'm going to do a demonstration where we can see dry ice as both the solid liquid and gas at the same time at what's called the triple point, right? Because I've, I've got little pressure vessels that I can kind of keep the dry ice contained. We can manipulate again, the phase of matter by changing the temperature and the pressure. If I have something at very low temperature, but very high pressure, this is how we make something like liquid nitrogen or solid carbon dioxide. Right? I can do that by both decreasing the temperature and increasing the pressure. Um, eventually, we reach this thing called a critical point, which is um, the temperature is so high that we cannot uh, maintain liquid state. Right, they're just moving too fast to glom onto each other at all. Uh, a lot of times, you you'll you know break your pressure vessel or whatever you're using, and when you reach that critical point. But do you guys have questions about these phase diagrams? You guys have questions or concerns about kind of how I've represented this up to this point? All right, I'm going to mess around with this FET program. You guys can go back to your. Uh, Nearpod, after you watch this for just a second, you guys can go back to your Nearpod uh, and, and do this yourselves. Um, but I also have it in the Google assignment for today. So, so no pressure, it's one way or the other here. Inside this chamber, I have solid ice. I know that it's solid because it has a definite shape and it has a, a definitive volume, right? What I can do is I can increase the temperature, which you'll see is making those particles vibrate much faster. Right? I can continue to increase the temperature and eventually, oh, look, I've, I've evaporated a single water molecule there, or a neon in this case. Now let's use water, it's easier to manipulate water. Let's cool it down and we'll make it freeze. Ooh, look at it expand. See how they have to arrange themselves in a certain way? Maybe I shouldn't use water, it's too much. Oxygen will be good. We heat it up. Then we're going to have a liquid here soon. See how the shape is now indefinite and those particles are able to flow over one another? We are now at a liquid state, right? So they have a definite volume, but an indefinite shape. If I continue to increase the heat, right, individual molecules will break free of those interparticulate forces and become gaseous. And you'll notice that when they hit each other, they no longer stick. They're starting to bounce off of one another because they're just moving too, too fast to stick together. And I continue to increase it. The other way, so now I've got some, um, some volume of water and I can actually increase the pressure. And when I force them close enough together, what you'll notice is that some of them will start to stick regardless of their temperature. And this is a little too hot. I think I've gone past the critical point here. Cool down. I can't cool this down faster. Come on, ice. I guess I could do it this way. Here we go. Stupid ice, stupid oxygen. Should have picked the polar molecule. Decrease the pressure. Nope, it's never going to get there. 
All right, I'm, I'm going to stop messing around with this. I think you guys get the idea. Um, if you don't get the idea, then there will be, uh, yeah, you, you'll have the opportunity on the assignment yourselves. Questions or concerns about this lesson today? Okay, on Google Classroom, you will find not only that FET uh, simulation, but also an assignment with that, that involves heating curves. Let's do both of those and we will reconvene, let's say at 11.10. That will give you guys 20 minutes, get as much of it done as you can. We're gonna go over the key afterwards anyway. Then it's gonna be your daily quiz. Then you guys are gonna get out of here. It was great to see you though. So let's, let's reconvene at 11.20, cool? Good luck. I'll be here if you have any questions.